Welcome back, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed last night's service. Welcome back for round two. If you wasn't with us yesterday, I am your host, Minister Stephen Barrett, and you are in for a treat tonight. Listen, before we get started, I want you guys to like, share this service with your family and friends so that they can be blessed. If this is your first night, the title of our revival this year is Revive Us Again. We're going to get this kicked off with another song selection from a special psalmist. And your heart is filled with despair. Remember, God cares. God cares for you. And when you're in town and you can't find your way out, He will see you through. See you yes, through. He will. See you through. Jesus, 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 Jesus,
SSNBC. You can pay that way, or you can call our Square app at 708-333-9521. That's 708-333-9521. Or you can drop off your love offering at uh, 15201 South Lexington in Harvey, Illinois, 60426. Let me pray over the offering. Lord God, we thank you for those who uh, gave tonight, Lord God, and those that had the desire to give, God. We pray for a special blessing right now, Father God. And we ask that your favor follow them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now it's time for altar call. There might be some things on your heart. Your heart might be heavy. We ask you now to just type it in the comment selection and lay your problems at the altar. I am going to pray for you as you do so right now. God, we thank you, we love you, we honor and adore you, God. You're just so worthy right now, Father God. And in this season, God, we ask that whatever you're doing, Lord God, we ask that you don't do it without us, God. We ask right now, Father God, that you revive us right now, Father God, so that we can continue to do your job and the work that you have for us in this season, God. We love you, God, we honor and adore you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now it's time that we're going to hear another song selection from our special guest. And after that, you will hear the guest speaker with the word from the Lord. Reverend Raquel C. N. Gill is a native of Winsboro, South Carolina. She was ordained for ministry at the age of 17 at St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church in Winsboro under the leadership of the late Reverend Roy C. Jeffcoat. Raquel is a 2012 graduate of Columbia College for Women in Columbia, South Carolina, where she holds a bachelor's degree in English education. Raquel received her Master's of Divinity in May of 2015 from Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. Upon completion of graduate school, Raquel joined the pastoral staff of the St. Paul Community Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, under the leadership of Pastor David K. Brawley. After pastoral residency, Raquel transitioned back to South Carolina and served as the Jack and Jane Presso Associate Chaplain at Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. Currently, she serves as the Minister for Intercultural Engagement at Duke University Chapel in Durham, North Carolina.
Psalm 129. So the 129th division of the Psalter, um, which many have labeled, right? Because um, they didn't have labels then, but many have labeled them since, uh, have labeled this particular Psalm as a prayer for the downfall of Israel's enemies. <laughs> and so this is one of the songs of ascent. And so I'm going to read it from the New Revised Standard Version, but whatever version you have is absolutely fine. And then we'll see what God might be trying to share with us together. Often they have attacked me from my youth. Let Israel now say, often they have attacked me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. But the Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backwards. Let them be like the grass on the housetops that withers before it grows, with which reapers do not fill their hands or binders of sheaves their arms. While those who pass by do not say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Psalm 129. Let's pray together. Let the words of our mouths, God, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Lord, whatever you decide to do in these next few moments where we are listening for your voice together, it will be all right with us. These and all of the blessings we ask in your son's name. Amen. Beloved, we are continuing our theme through the Psalms of Ascent. And I want to talk as we deal with this particular psalm from this idea, show me where it hurts. Show me where it hurts. Now, I'm sure at this point it has been emphasized that these psalms are the words of a people who are on a pilgrimage to their high and holy place after they have endured and survived a catastrophic crisis, a period of captivity. The language of pilgrimage matters when we get to our psalm of emphasis today. Psalm 129 is a point in their journey where they explicitly talk about the oppression that they have experienced and the complicated feelings for the people who have mistreated them. It's important to recognize that they were sojourners on a pilgrimage and not just tourists taking a trip. You know how it is when we say stop acting like a tourist. Tourists travel to a destination just to tap into the fun parts and the enjoyable parts of the journey. We go to Disneyland and Six Flags and these destination cities so we can go where the fun is, where the entertainment is, where we can let the good times roll. But a pilgrimage is different. You see, here in Durham, where I currently live, we have a program called the Pilgrimage of Pain and Hope. And this pilgrimage takes you through the history of racism, gentrification, and poverty in the city. And one of my colleagues who leads this journey says it's a pilgrimage and not a tour because tourists want to go where the attractions are. But a pilgrimage is when you dare to go where the pain is. Beloved, this psalm is important for the journey with God. Because so many times we can treat our spiritual walk as tourists and not sojourners. So many times we want to go to the enjoyable parts of our lives. We want to stay in the easy terrain of our existence. But Psalm 129 teaches us that at some point as you walk with God, you got to be willing to go where it hurts. You got to be willing to journey to where the pain is. And so there are some lessons that I see in this text on what it means to go where the pain is. The first thing I see is that as we take this journey, this pilgrimage with God, we remember our history. We remember our history. We see this particular psalm beginning with the children of Israel, making an implication about their condition as a people. And I know the language makes it sound as if someone is talking about a very personal experience with abuse. And 
I believe that this can be applicable for your own personal devotion, if that is your story. And I'll share that more even as we journey. But we must always remember that these Psalms are about their condition as a community, not just one person sharing a story. As a people, Israel declares that from our infancy, we have constantly been under attack referring to their earlier history in Egypt, where they were forced to be taskmasters for Pharaoh, and now to their experience of exile. They are declaring that their oppression, their mistreatment, and their abuse as a people has not been short-lived, has not been periodic, and these are not isolated incidents. But as a community, they have suffered prolonged pain, and they have suffered sustained abuse over and over again. I love the format of the Psalms because there's a refrain that says, let Israel now say, but it basically means say it again. And the Psalm repeats it again, saying from our youth, people have constantly attacked us. Here in this Psalm, we see a people who even as they move forward, they consistently find a need to remember, to recall, and to repeat the pain of their past. As they seek to rebuild, they are sure that they must always remember. They must remember their mistreatment. They must remember the abuse. They must remember the oppression, not because they want to relive the trauma, but because in order to understand who you are in the present, you must be willing to reflect on who you have been in the past. This psalm gives a people who have been oppressed the permission to remember their experience. Our oppressors might be tired of hearing it, but they will never stop us from repeating it. We will remember our history. We will recall our story. We will repeatedly give voice to our past struggles because we can't journey into a new tomorrow if we don't remember the lessons of yesterday. And one thing I've learned as an American is that we spend so much time trying to ignore the demons of the past and then we wonder why they continually haunt us. I fully believe that we are a very critical culture, but we are not a, a very reflective culture. In order to move forward into your future, you must be willing to go back and reflect on some experiences in the past. In order to make sense of the oppression that people experience today, we must be willing to reflect on how we got here in the first place. This is why the African symbol of the Sankofa bird is so important. Sankofa is a phrase that means go back and fetch it. In an age of so much disinformation and misinformation, history still matters. This is why we must always push back when they try to not teach about race in public schools. We must always educate the coming generations on the the trauma of slavery, the trauma of the Middle Passage, the trauma of the Holocaust, the trauma of apartheid, and other points in history where people have been abused and exploited. That's why if you are Black or Brown in this country, it is important to make sure your children understand the heritage of, the, of their people, how they endured slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, how they journeyed to this country as migrants and immigrants with no money and little resources and built an entire life out of nothing. Because in order to know where you're going, you must first be able to understand where you have been. But not only is it important to remember corporately, I believe psychology would tell us that it matters personally. I want to hone in on the phrase from youth because it speaks to the most vulnerable time in your life that affects the rest of your life. The most vulnerable person in the world is a child. I love and repeat this quote from author Toni Morrison who, who once said, what you do to children matters and they might never forget. What you do to children matters and they might never forget. 
forget. What are you saying, preacher? As a minister, the more I hear people's stories, the more I recognize that most of us don't experience a healthy adulthood until we face the unhealthy parts of our childhood. I know you got a good job now. I know you got a few degrees now. I know you live in a nice suburban house now, but many of us are realizing how some of our achievements are nothing more than the trauma responses to childhood pain. A good deal of us are spending good time with folks like Reverend Gina and paying good money to good therapists, not to talk about current events in our lives, but to process childhood and young adult experiences. Recently, I watched Oprah Winfrey's interview with actress Viola Davis. The biggest takeaway of that interview was when Viola said that for most of her career, she has been fighting the trauma of her childhood, despite all of her success, despite Despite all of her beauty, despite all of her brilliance, despite the many awards that she can claim to her name, Viola said that most of the time she still felt like that damaged little girl in Rhode Island who was constantly teased and constantly taunted and constantly told that she was ugly and made to feel like she was not enough. For some of us, remembering the past is finding the strength to heal from the pain of past experiencing experiences. It's acknowledging the poverty, it's naming the abuse, it's recognizing the dysfunction, it's calling out the bullying, it's owning the grief, not because we need to relive the pain, but because processing what happened then is necessary for our growth now. In order to imagine a new future, you must be willing to recall, to remember, and to reflect on the pain of your past. And so as we journey, we remember our history. But secondly, as we journey, we recognize our resilience. We recognize our resilience. Beloved, as you remember difficult experiences in your past, you recognize your own resilience to survive it. Resilience is a complicated word, and I'll speak to more of that in a second, but sometimes a recognition of it can be healthy for our sense of self-affirmation. Resilience is your capacity to bounce back from hard times. Resilience is what it means to get back on your feet when life knocks you off of your feet. Resilience is your resurrection power. The psalmist declares that yes, we have constantly been attacked, but we have not been defeated yet. Our oppressors have constantly attacked us, yet they have not destroyed us. Here they are as a community. They have survived the exodus. They have survived the migration of the wilderness. They have survived the death of leader after leader. They have survived exile. And as they sing their song, they choose to not only name the evil that they have experienced, but they affirm their own strength as a community to not be defeated by it. They recognize that they were more than their struggles. They were more than their pain. They were more than their oppressors. Their history was a part of who they are, but their history was not all of who they are. The psalmist reframes the narrative from their victimhood and abuse to their ability to live beyond it. This matters to a community that has been disregarded. This matters in a community that has been marginalized. This matters in a community that has been made to believe that they are less than and that they will never quite measure up. This matters to people who have experienced crisis after crisis because we speak as we speak against the systems of oppression, we must always affirm the dignity of the people who have survived them. Sometimes people don't just need your sympathy over what happened to them, but they need your affirmation for the way they have resolved to keep living despite the pain that they have experienced. It takes creativity to make it through school when you grew up poor. It takes courage to keep living after abuse. It takes strength to pick up the pieces after your life has fallen apart. It takes resilience to keep living when life has the nerve to keep throwing curveballs and challenges your way. Think about some of the hardest moments of your life. It would have been easy to give up. 
It would have been easy to throw in the towel. It would have been easy to just succumb to grief. But look at you today in worship, declaring to the world that you're still here. If nobody else celebrates you, you deserve to celebrate yourself. You deserve to pat yourself on the back. You deserve to encourage yourself. As we name the difficulty we experience, we must recognize that when you've been beaten down by life, your very existence is a result. Resistance. Every day you choose to wake up, every day you choose to show up is a proclamation to the forces of evil that you haven't beaten me yet. The psalmist declares, but they haven't beaten me yet as a reminder to the forces against you that they are never a match for the power that lies within you. The poet Lucille Clifton would put it this way. Won't you celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me, but it failed. I may made it through the heartache. I'm living in spite of the pain. I didn't give up after the mistreatment. Every day something has tried to kill us, but thank God that it failed. So as we journey, we remember our history. As we journey, we recognize our resilience. But then thirdly, as we journey, we find freedom in God's presence. Some of us are thinking, yes, Reverend, the struggles I have faced may not have killed me, but they have deeply affected me. The difficulty may not have beaten me. It may not have destroyed me, but I can be honest and say it has definitely hurt me. I've taken some hits. I've taken some losses. I'm different. I can feel it. In verse three, the psalmist says, they've plowed my back like farmers. They have made their furrows deep. This verse induces the imagery of farming, and it's been argued about a lot by commentators and scholars, but one thing nobody can dispute, and that is that this struggle and this mistreatment that these people endured did not just batter their spirits, but it harmed their bodies. I don't want to be a trigger today, and so I don't want to go into too much detail. But I don't want to skim over the real harm that some of us may have experienced in our actual bodies. The psalmist is saying that our oppressors have not treated our bodies like a horse that is forced to pull the plow but they have treated our bodies like the dirt to be plowed and the soil to be tilled, constantly ripped and pulled at. They have produced and exploited and built their own wealth on our very backs. They have not loved our bodies. They have not cared for our bodies. They have not allowed us to tend to the well-being of our bodies. And we may not be dead yet, but on our bodies, we bear the wounds and the pain of this experience. And beloved, I will save you a history lesson on slavery and how the black and indigenous body has been pillaged and plowed all throughout American history. But what I will say is this, if you have experienced discrimination, injustice or abuse in your life, it has not only hurt your soul, but it has also affected your body. The mind may keep the memory, but the body holds the wounds. After all of the stress of the pandemic and the racial uprisings of 2020, Auburn University has been studying how systemic oppression will literally age your cells prematurely. Psychological stressors such as racism, sexism, poverty, violence, homophobia can literally cause your body to feel as if it is aging prematurely. Some of us have had the most heartbreaking experiences and we thought we were dealing with that stuff just fine until we went to the doctor. Some of these comorbidities that we have developed, hypertension and diabetes and heart disease and chronic pain are often real indicators of the way that stress and grief and heartache is taking real root in our actual bodies. And in your journey with God, it is okay to not only be grateful for how you've gotten through the pain, but to also be honest about how you are living with the wounds. And living with the wounds can be exhausting. It can be tiresome. I said earlier that resistance is a compli resilience is a complicated word. 
Resilience is complicated for people who have been oppressed and for people who have always struggled. Resilience robs you of your energy. Some of us, if we would be honest today, probably feel as if we have no more resilience left after these past few years. Some of us have had to navigate and move through so much transition, so many changes, and so much pain that we are almost to the point of saying, if life throws anything else at me, I don't quite know if I will have the strength to keep pushing through. Some of us may have felt like we had no time to actually create the life we want because we keep having to respond and react to the life we have. But the psalmist says, not only have we not been beaten by the oppression, but by the power of God, we have been freed from it. The psalmist declares in verse four that the Lord is righteous and God cuts the very chains of the wicked, the very cords that the wicked uses to entrap us and hold us back. God steps in and cuts us free from it. It is not only God's will for you to have the strength to keep surviving mistreatment, but it is God's plan for you to be free from the source of your mistreatment treatment. And I know so much of Christian language has taught us to endure and stick it out. But this psalm helps us to see that God doesn't just want you to have the resilience to get through toxic environments, but in God's presence, you should be able to find relief and liberation from it. The strength you use to survive the mistreatment, to survive the abuse, to survive the toxicity is the energy you need to thrive when God frees you from it. I need somebody who can testify that God will not just be with you in the midst of pain, but God will step in and set you free, free from the people who have caused your pain. One translation says that God not only freed us from the grips of harm, but God ripped the harness of the plowman. The harness is the device that keeps the system of plowing in place. The Psalm says not only will God free us from the grips of the harness, but the justice of God will destroy the entire system of harm that is in place. In other words, not only will God make it so they no longer hurt us again, but God will make it so they can't hurt anybody else. When it comes to oppression, abuse, and exploitation, sometimes we can praise people for pushing through difficult conditions and do absolutely nothing to free them from the conditions that they've had to push through. But not only will God free you from the traps of the wicked, but God will cut the very cords so that they can no longer be in a position to hurt anyone else. We must be able to believe that not only does God not want this to happen to me, but God doesn't want this to happen at all. As a Black woman, this text reminds me that the liberation of God is not just me praising God for my own freedom, but it is recognizing that it is my job to pull up my sleeve and be empowered by God to work on behalf of the freedom of somebody else. As the freedom, as the people of God, we have to do God's work in the world of not only freeing people from the grips of harm, but uprooting the very systems of harm that are in place. It's not enough to restore people from the harm they have experienced, but we must do the work to see the very systems dismantled. We rip the harness of the wicked when we fall resources to struggling communities. We rip the harness of the wicked when we hold politicians accountable for how they treat the most vulnerable. We rip the harness of the wicked when we stand in solidarity with oppressed people all over the world. We rip the harness of the wicked when we push back against policies that seek to deny the rights and freedom of a particular group of people. The harness must be ripped and we as the people of God must do the work of dismantling the entire system. The harness keeps the system in place, but the harness is what holds everything together. So literally, in order for God to free them from their pain, God had to let what was holding things together fall completely apart. 
In order to free them, God had to break the thing that was holding this process together. That can feel like a real metaphor for life sometimes. Sometimes we are so busy trying to keep things up and hold things together that we will stay stuck and stagnant in a harmful place because we don't know how to let some stuff fall apart. I'm talking to somebody who knows that a situation is no longer working for you. It's no longer serving you. It's no longer of meeting your needs and doing what it's supposed to do for you, but you keep trying to hold it together because you're afraid of how people will look at you when things fall apart. But baby, when it comes to your freedom, you can't be concerned about how it looks. People might have their opinions. People might have their perspectives. People might have their thoughts, but at the end of the day, your healing is not in their hands. And I can't help but thank God because sometimes in my life, when it felt like things were falling apart. I see now when I look back that God was just setting me free. There were certain opportunities that fell through, certain relationships that dissolved, certain jobs that didn't work out. And I think about how much pressure I put on myself then trying to hold it all together, never wanting people to see that I was struggling. But I had to learn that when you walk with God, you can find peace when things fall apart because you trust that God will help you put things back together. Sometimes there's something better on the other side that God will lead you to. Might not be a higher paying job. It might not be a new spouse, but it might mean a freer you. Don't be held hostage to a plan for your life that is no longer working. When you serve a Christ who came to set the captives free, beloved in the name of Jesus, be set free. And so lastly, as we journey, as we walk with God, we find space for complicated emotions. We find space for complicated emotions. We remember our history. We recognize our resilience. We find freedom in God's presence. And then lastly, we find safety for our complicated emotions. The children of Israel have recognized that they have been attacked, but not beaten. They've been wounded, but set free. And even in their freedom, they make space for some complicated emotions. It's no secret that in verses five through eight, they are hoping for the downfall of their oppressors. They are praying that those who have caused them harm will be cut down. They are praying that they will be put to shame. And even as they are grateful for a God who breaks the chains of their oppression, they do not suppress their real emotions about the people who have done them wrong. Even in their worship, even as they pray to God, they make space for their anguish and they make space for their anger. And I know you're getting uncomfortable, but we got to be honest about the fact that you can be grateful for God's deliverance from the pain and still harbor some intense emotions about the pain and the people who caused it. So much of our Christian culture forces people to a place of positivity and forgiveness prematurely that doesn't allow them to fully sit with the complexities of all of their emotions. And I know you're taught about this at South Euclid, but maybe somebody needs a refresher. We spend so little time dismantling oppression and so much time demonizing people for how they respond to their own mistreatment. We don't give people space to be mad at their abuser. We don't give people space to be angry with the person who violated them. We present forgiveness to them as a really, really bitter pill that they might not be quite ready to swallow. This is why the Psalms are so important. I was set free when I became familiar with the work of Old Testament scholar, Dr. Walter Brueggemann. Dr. Brueggemann has done some amazing research on the Psalter, but what I've been fascinated by is his work on what he calls imprecatory psalms. Dr. Brueggemann argues that the Psalms are not people speaking for God, but the Psalms are people speaking to God. And because there are people speaking to God, we can learn from the fact that they did not keep any emotions from God. We can learn from the fact that when they went to God in prayer, when they worshiped God in song, they didn't suppress their anger before God, but they felt safe enough in their humanity to release it to God. They felt 
safe enough to tell God about their rage. They felt safe enough to tell God about their anger. They felt safe enough to tell God that they wanted God to take revenge. Dr. Brueggemann proposes that there are three things we can do with our anger. Either we will act it out, either we will deny it and cover it up, or either we can release it to God. When you act it out, you make decisions now that you will regret later. When you cover it up, it slowly begins to eat you up and causes you to lash out later. But when you release it to God, you relinquish its power over you. The answer is not to tell people who've been harmed, violated, abused, and exploited that they shouldn't feel angry about their experience, but the answer is to tell them that they can release it to God when the anger comes up. When you take the fullness of your emotions to God, I believe that it's not just a venting session, but it's a healing session. It's a bit like when you go to the doctor about a pain that you're feeling that just won't go away. And usually the doctor will ask you to start describing your symptoms. And then eventually the doctor says something that I've always found profound. The doctor says, now show me where it hurts. And it's at that moment that you have to point to the place of your pain in hopes that the doctor can help facilitate your healing. Usually if you're in enough pain, you don't care how bad your body looks. You will get completely naked if necessary, just so the doctor can actually see what's causing you so much pain. And I believe that when Israel prayed in precatory songs, it's their way of getting naked before God. It's their way of showing God where it hurts. I believe that when we take our anger, our bitterness, our frustrations to the presence of God, that's our way of showing God where it hurts. And we don't have to be concerned about how bad it looks. That's our way of pointing to the pain, pointing to the frustration, pointing to the hurt, believing that when I show you where it hurts, you can facilitate my healing in due season. So I want to help somebody today. This, of course, is not for everybody. We're all in different places on our journey, but I believe that this might be for somebody, somebody who is honest enough to say, God, I'm grateful that I got out of it, but there are some days that I'm still angry that I went through it. God, I'm thankful that I lived beyond it, but there are pieces of me that are bitter about how it went down. God, I'm glad to be on the other side of it, but I still got some rage for how they treated me in the midst of it. I will never forget I was talking to my mom about a frustration. I felt so mistreated and violated by this person. And I remember my mama saying, Kel, don't go to bed with so much anger in your body. I remember her saying that sometimes when I'm frustrated with your daddy, they had been married for 30 something odd years. She said, but when I'm frustrated with your daddy, I have to go to God angry so I don't go to bed angry. I have to go to God angry so I don't go to bed angry. And I know that seems really trite, but I think about my mama who didn't have a million degrees, who didn't have a million uh, psychological certifications, but in her own way, she knew that when you take the rawness of your emotions to God, that you are safe enough to say exactly how you feel in God's arms. So beloved, don't fight the feeling. Don't suppress the rage. Don't hide the anger, but believe today that you are safe enough to talk to God all about it, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my precious savior. I surrender all. It's all right, beloved, to show God where it hurts. Amen. Amen. And I say, what an exciting time we are having in this revival. The word of God has went forward again on tonight. We thank God for our speaker and for the nuggets and the deposit of God's word into our lives. So at this time, if you want to accept Jesus as your personal savior, you can take all that you've heard in this revival on tonight and you can now apply the word of God to your life. One way to do that is by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal savior. How do you do that? You just 
accept. You just believe and you just confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's just that simple. We invite you to join South Suburban Missionary Baptist Church where the word of God is going forward. We know that God is doing great things in our lives and we also want that same thing for you. And so we open up our church doors at this time. All you have to do is enter your information into the chat or the comment section of your Facebook or your YouTube, whatever you're looking at. Enter your information and say, I want to be saved or I want to join South Suburban. Either way, we will reach out to you. We will connect with you. And from there, your life will never be the same. While you're yet thinking, while you're yet in the process of making up your mind to accept Christ and to join our ministry, let me pray a word of prayer over your life. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for all that you're doing in the lives of the believers. And for those that are listening, Lord, and ready to make up their minds to accept you and to follow you, God. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would open up the red carpet, dear God. Lord, that you would give them everything that you've given unto me, dear God, and unto us, Father, as Christians. Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, that uh, the steps, your word says, of a good person are ordered by the Lord. And Father, Lord, that you are directing their steps right now so that they can accept you and become part of this great family and this great kingdom of yours. Lord, we thank you, dear God, Lord, for those that are yet deciding and Lord, that you would help them in their decision. We give you all praise and we thank you for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Haven't we had a great time these last two nights of revival? Revive us again. What a great time we've had. God has truly been in the midst of this revival, doing great things, sharing the word, and uh, giving us what we need in our hearts and in our minds so that we can overcome, so that we can be revived, we can be refreshed and renewed. I don't know about you, but I am so excited for what God is going to do next. Don't miss out on our worship night. We want you to join us for another night of worship where we're going to be singing songs and praising God and praying unto the Lord. Definitely be a part of our night, our worship night on tomorrow. Come join us once more and enjoy and celebrate with us in this time of revival. While we're yet finishing this up, on tonight, let me say a word of prayer over your life. Dear Lord, we thank you, Father Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you for how you've come into this space and into this revival and you have given us a, a refreshment, given us something to renew our spirit. Lord, I thank you, Father Lord, that we are revived again. Hallelujah. And I thank you, Lord, that you've been in the midst of all of this. Lord, I pray, Father Lord, that your word hasn't fallen on deaf ears, dear God. Lord, that it has reached the hearts of those that have listened, dear God, Lord, and that everything that you've uh, shared with us through your word, God, through the speaker who gave us that word, Lord, that we shall receive it. Father, I thank you, dear God, Lord, that everyone who's listening under the sound of my voice is blessed. It's tremendously blessed, and their lives will never be the same. And so, Lord, I just give you all praise and thanks. Thank you for this time of revival. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.